now we'll talk about the closed Sicilian. The closed Sicilian is featured after white plays e4, knight c3, and g3 against black Sicilian defense. Let's see what that looks like over the board. So the game will typically go e4, c5, knight c3, knight c6, and now g3. And this is a closed Sicilian. So in the past decades, this opening was popular with players like Smyslov, Spassky, and even today it has plenty of admirers and at all levels, from beginners to grandmasters. So by playing knight to c3 before opening the diagonal for the bishop, white is basically anticipating the liberating d5. The most common response is obviously knight to c6, after which white will play g3 with the idea of developing the bishop to g2 and preventing any action along the d5 square. Another very good plan for black would be instead of developing with knight to c6, but playing e6. And this idea is basically to prepare the d5 push. And it's good for players who don't mind static weaknesses like their pawn structure and are okay with isolated pawns uh, in a middle game. So something that should be stated about this opening is that when white plays g3 and bishop g2, he's really trying to play a closed system where he has greater control over the center so that he could practically play on the flanks. This is why white doesn't play neither in the center, he's kind of passive in the center, and on the queen side. And he typically plays with pawn advances or pawn pushes uh, on the flanks, or, or more precisely uh, on the king's flank. It should be recalled or noted by beginner players that to be able to attack uh, you have to have good control of the center and sometimes the position that means sometimes that can mean that you know you have a, 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 a robust or a solid pawn structure in the center or po quite possibly the center's closed which is why you're playing in the flanks so let's take a look at what a close Sicilian game will typically look like let's go back a couple of moves knight c3 knight c6 g3, g6, bishop g2, bishop g7, and now d3. Black will typically respond with d6. So the most common plan here starts with f4, but more recently the move bishop to e3 has become uh, pretty popular. So the plan here with queen d2, bishop h6, h4, h5, is actually pretty dangerous uh, to encounter especially if black reacts mechanically however white needs to kind of be careful as to how he plays that uh, that sequence of moves because there are a couple of traps in which he could fall victim to for instance if black now plays e6 white continues with queen to d2 knight e7 bishop a6 pretty straightforward castles h4 it looks like a dream position for white bishop h6 queen h6 and now a very quiet move f6 and the idea is the following if now white continues with h6 then black will play g5 and the queen is trapped black will play king h8 knight g8 and that would be lights out for the queen so all that means is that white has to play correctly and instead of playing h5 after f6 he should play queen to d2 and he has a small plus in this position. It has a lot to do with the fact that he has more flexibility to play in the center or on the king side and there are a lot of pawn weaknesses on, on black's flank. Usually a good plan for black would be to play rook to b8. And after knight, to g, knight g to e2 threatening d4 Black should counter with knight to d4, castles, e6, queen d2, b5, or knight to e7. And black will have sufficient counterplay in these types of positions. However, as previously stated, the more common move is for white to play 6, f4. So let's take a look at that uh, 
as quickly as we can. And so here white plays f4. Excuse me, d6, f4. So this is the most common move, basically planning a pawn storm on the king side. And now black basically sees counterplay by expanding on the queen side with b5 and b4. And black fundamentally has four approaches. He could either develop the king's knight to the f6 square. However, placing the knight there uh, has the effect that, it, that it's basically a little exposed to the, to the advance of white's pawns on e5 and g4. Just like Kara said, when there are pawn attacks or kings are castled in opposite sides, uh, it's very important to take into consideration those pawn pushes that gain tempos because they typically mean that white will have an extra move in the position. Another plan that black could have here is that he could prepare immediate counterplay on the queen side with rook to b8 and basically just push his queen side pawns uh, down the board. Another plan would be for black to play e5. This is along the lines of the Botvinnik variation of the English opening with basically colors reversed. Sometimes it's uh, the idea is played with black playing first e6 and then e5, but uh, it could also be played directly. We could we could say that from all these options, the last two options are the most common. So let's first take a look at at the c5 response. So after 6, f4, and e5 by black, this is basically a very ambitious continuation, which at first glance seems a little illogical, because it blocks the extended control of the black square bishop, and basically helps white to open the f-file. However, black, black takes possession of the e5 square, and plays a lot more fluid. It's it's really suitable for players who prefer positions that are more open than those that are produced by e6. White will now continue with knight to h3. So the reason why knight to h3 is played is basically because a lot of black players could be unaware to the possibilities that white position holds. So if for instance um, black will play natural moves here like knight c7 followed by castles what white will do is that he'll play castles and he'll play f5 sometimes even sacrificing a pawn to get really good play in this position the queen will later go to h5 the knight will go to g5 and white basically has an autopilot attack so in this position there are naturally two responses black could either capture on f4 with the pawn or he can play knight to d4 if knight d4 then once again, f5 is a pretty good move, sacrificing a pawn, or white could also play bishop to e3, trying to play as solid as possible. Let's take a look at the straightforward variation, pawn takes f4. So here, after black recaptures on f4, there's really not an option to capture with the pawn, because after bishop takes h3, bishop h3, black will play queen h4, and he's up a piece. So going back, in this position, there's only two options, either capturing with the bishop or with the knight. But the knight seems more natural because you have greater control of the d5 square. And here it looks like both sides have made an equal exchange. White now has greater control of the white squares in the position, uh, along with the knights and the bishops. And black has greater control of these dark squares in the center. Excuse me. And so both sides have something to play on in this position. We could basically say that this position is dynamically equal. So with that said, now let's look at uh, the other line where black chooses to play e6. So moving back a couple of moves after f4 and now e6. So uh, this is a very common variation is the idea is to have greater control over the f5 square. Additionally, the knight is going to be developed to e7, where it leaves black with the option, the flexibility of one being able to play f5 himself, and also to transfer his knight to the c6 square, where it will have greater control of d4. So typically here, white always tries to play with g4 and, ha and uh, basically launch a kingside attack 
uh, with his pawns. And this is why it's so important for black to have these uh, resources available. Now, uh, a very common line that's been played here is knight to f3, knight e7, castles, castles, bishop e3, and now knight to d4. And in this position, there's a gambit where black white plays e5. It's pretty interesting and pretty remarkable. So in this position, after the e5 push, um, it, could, it should be said that it's not the only way of playing the position, but if black accepts the gambit, um, white will have plenty of compensation for the pawn. And uh, okay, this is not necessarily the antidote versus the Sicilian, but it uh, okay it leads to good play for white, and uh, it's a satisfactory response. If white were to capture on f3, white recaptures and now pawn takes. Um, what have we gained here? We have two open lines or diagonals for our bishops, which are exerting extreme pressure on the queen side. White has gained the e4 square for the knight. He's weakened the c5, d6, and e5 square for black. And he also will have two open files for his rooks. So he has plenty of activity for a pawn. Alternatively, there's another variation that white could play here, as previously stated. And that's, he could either choose to play bishop to f2 to capture on d4 and not be forked after the eventual exchange, or he could also play the very quiet and the move played by Anatoly Karpov, rook to b1. So once again, these type of positions are not the type of positions where you have to memorize tons of theory, but you just have to be familiar and acquainted with the kind of strategical subtleties of the position. Because it's so strategically complex, the positions are typically more favorable for players that are stronger as opposed to the one that knows uh, the variation the variations greater or in greater depth thanks to their memory so with that said let's look at a model game played it played in the close Sicilian going back a couple of moves and the game that I'm going to show you is a game played by Boris Spassky an expert in the close Sicilian versus FM Geller, a theoretical, basically super genius that was an incredibly strong Soviet player back in the day. So the game started with e4, c5, knight c3, d6, g3, knight c6, bishop g2, all very standard, we've seen this already, g6, d3, bishop g7, f4, the most uh, popular response, knight to f6. As previously stated, um, this this is you know we have to be careful with the sign because of how vulnerable it could be to our pawn pushes. Knight f3, castles, castles, rook b8, h3, playing very slowly, but at the same time uh, with a lot of power because we're threatening to play g4, f5, and g5. E5, A3. The idea is to play positionally here. Basically, if white uh, pushes, if black pushes, then white will recapture. And all right, black is getting counterplay on the on on the queen side, but white has basically opened the file for his rook. A5, Bishop E3, B4, a mutual exchange. Knight e2, bishop e7. Notice how white's pieces are now coming towards the king side. b3, rook a8, rook c1. Um, white doesn't want to exchange rooks because this rook is going to do an essential job here, and that's to defend the biggest weakness on white's king's on white's queen side, and that would be the c2 pawn. Rook a2 g4. Now everything is straightforward. We know that all of white's play is going to be on the king side. Queen a8, queen e1, bringing the queen towards the king. Queen a6, queen f2, knight a7, rerounding the knight to one of these squares. f5, knight b5, Pawn takes g6, pawn takes g6, and now knight to g5. 
Things are getting interesting here. White will play queen to h4 at one point and will have threats of rook takes f6. Knight a3, targeting the c2 pawn. Queen h4, just in time. Rook c8, rook takes f6. What a brilliant sacrifice. Obviously played by one of the better attacking players in the history of chess. Pawn takes f6, queen h7 check, king f8. Now can you see the best move here? Knight takes f7. Rook takes c2. Bishop h6. Rook c1, knight c1. King f7, queen g7 check. King e8, g5, f5, queen g6 check, king d7, queen f7 check, king c6, and after pawn takes f5, black resigns.